You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is a good day when we get to talk about church programs, church work programs, and learning about uh, what is a, what is a church worker. And today we're going to specifically focus in on deaconess. What is a deaconess and a new program available to make that deaconess formation available, accessible um, to many more women. Excited to share that with you. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for support of the Coffee Hour. I can find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us for the Coffee Hour today, Deaconess Dr. Jillian Bond. She's Director of Deaconess Studies at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Thanks so much for being our guest today, Dr. Bond. Thank you for having me on the program. So what is... A deaconess for those. <laughs> I, we, we talk with deaconesses all the time, but there might be some who, who really don't have a, a full picture of what a deaconess is or what a deaconess isn't, maybe. Good point. There are indeed people who, who don't have a, a clear picture of that. A deaconess is basically a, a theologically trained woman whom our Lord has led to serve uh, his church in ways that include, that encompass um, spiritual care, teaching the faith, and works of mercy. And the program that we have, the residential program that we have at Concordia Seminary actually involves a, a degree with a major, a master's degree with a major in spiritual care, because we really see that spiritual care as being not only the spiritual side, but holistic. So look after the whole person, which includes teaching the faith and also works of mercy. Where are some of the places that deaconesses serve? I think a lot of times we uh, maybe assume that deaconesses only serve in the parish, uh, but is, is that the case or are there other places that deaconesses serve as well? There are other places. Quite a lot of deaconesses do serve in the parish and it's not necessarily an either or. Sometimes it's a both and, both in a parish and doing something else. Uh, we talk about three main areas of service, one being congregational, one being institutional, and that covers a lot of things, which I'll come back to in a moment, and the other being missions. So there are some uh, deaconesses who serve in international missions. Uh, within this country, um, as far as institutional is concerned, that could include the appropriate aspects of for a woman of chaplaincy work. So that could be working through a hospital system or, uh, say, a senior um, assisted living or nursing home or there are various of those kinds of entities. And then also, it can include a number of other things. So, for example, one of our fairly recent alumni is actually working at the Dakota Boys and Girls Ranch, which is a recognized service organization of the Synod. And uh, so there's various areas within recognized service organizations that, that deaconesses can serve. For example, also working with, um, you know, crisis pregnancy centers, or shelters for, for women. There's a, a wide variety of places where they can serve. So then what are the uh, what are what are some key aspects of deaconess formation? The uh, one of the, obviously the fir first key aspect is basically giving a good solid theological foundation because as Lutherans, obviously for us scripture is is the sole rule and norm of faith. It's what's at the foundation of what, what all of all of what we do. And also then of course the, the Lutheran confession. So they get good solid instruction both in working with the scriptures, also in Lutheran systematic theology, Lutheran doctrine, and then also uh, introduction to historical theology and good basic background in practical theology. Much of the coursework that our deaconess students do, whether in the residential program or in this new online program is taken in common with students who are learning, studying towards serving as pastors, not the things that would be specific to the pastoral office, obviously, those are substituted with deaconess specific courses, but for the basic theology, it's the same theology that, that we all believe, obviously, and that, mm -hmm. that they need to have a, a good foundation in. So then our, in addition to that foundation, it's the areas of service where and how women serve and how that is laid out in scripture. And then also how to go about doing that, how to uh, write and teach Bible studies for women, how to um, 
how to give spiritual care to people in a variety of situations. As, as you know, any, anybody in church work, we work with people in a whole range of life situations, both in the best of times and in the worst of times. So people who are grieving, people who are dealing with all kinds of difficulties in their lives, tragedies or whatever, how to give the appropriate spiritual care in those contexts, as well as how to work with people when times are going more smoothly for them. Um, and um, the teaching aspect, the response to questions, one of the things that was surprising to me when I first trained as a deaconess, but I've seen it so many times over the years, is that there, it's not all women by any means, but there are a lot of women in our congregations who have really profound questions, um, oftentimes really profound theological questions, a matter of, you know, like eternal life or eternal death type questions, um, that they just, they're more comfortable talking to a woman, but it needs to be somebody who has the theological training to deal with it. And so there are many ways in which there is, there are both opportunities and needs for theologically trained women to work in, you know, appropriately alongside pastors within our church. What are the current paths to becoming a deaconess in our church body? There are both online and residential options. There are deaconess programs at both seminaries, so here in St. Louis and at Fort Wayne, and also at Concordia University, Chicago. I can speak in more detail to the programs here, but just so that folks know there are the, the three institutions that, that uh, have deaconess programs. Uh, with, within the programs here, we have a residential program which combines a Master of Arts with a major in spiritual care with the additional residential field education, internship, and so on to um, enable a person to be considered for certification for service as a deaconess. We also have a dual degree program, which includes also working with St. Louis University for, towards a master's in social work. And what makes it a dual degree program rather than just two separate degrees is that each institution takes some credit hours from the other um, in lieu of what would otherwise be elective hours taken at that institution. So, our, so from the perspective of Concordia Seminary, the students that go that route, their choice of electives is essentially the choice to do the dual degree program. So um, there are courses from there that transfer in in place of the elective hours and vice versa from here to St. Louis University. There are also distance programs. So we have uh, the, the two distance routes that were already in existence here at Concordia Seminary were uh, through EIIT, the Ethnic Immigrant Institute of Theology, which incorporates also what used to be separately DIT, the Deaf Institute of Theology. So it gave a, a route for women who belong to particular ethnic immigrant communities or who belong to the deaf community to study alongside with suitable course substitutions where appropriate to study alongside men who were uh, studying to be pastors through either EIIT or, or the, the Deaf Institute of Theology, right, which is now under EIIT. And then also for those whose uh, first language is Spanish through the Center for Hispanic Studies, there's also programs, distance programs, both for uh, future pastors and deaconesses through CHS, the Center for Hispanic Studies as well. Uh, however, those programs were not, in terms of, for deaconesses, were not available, obviously, for distance study for those who were not members of either, you know, an, an ethnic or immigrant or deaf community or um, the Spanish is their native language, their first language. Uh, so the new program fills that, that void, as it were, for other potential deaconess students who are not geographically mobile. Tell us a little bit more about this new program uh, and what what is maybe either the same or different than the residential program, uh, and uh, and some of the the point the the, the, the features about it. The uh, there are there are women just to sort of give a little background. There are women whom God is evidently leading in the direction of doing the acronym type of work who are involved with. Uh, usually congregations, sometimes it could be an RSO or other, <coughs> excuse me, institutional setting um, locally where they are, <coughs> excuse me, but who are not geographically mobile for a variety of reasons, but often, uh, most often including at least family reasons. Uh, so they can't come for residential studies. Uh, 
the, this is a program where the, uh, it includes both coursework, which is done with synchronous sessions as part of a cohort that would meet, will meet uh, online, live online once a week during the session, during the, the term. Uh, and then also, obviously, work between those live sessions that is done during the week. But then also there is a concurrent internship. And that basically replaces what for the residential students would be the part-time RFE, resident field education, during their coursework and the one-year full-time internship. So this is a concurrent internship that runs through the whole distance program. Um, the distance program involves 16 courses, one course at a time, four courses a year sequentially. And so it's a, overall a four-year program. It's set up in a way that people who have outside jobs that they need to keep, for example, can still keep working. Um, and so it's, it, it's a part-time program, not a full-time program. But there is this uh, four-year concurrent internship with it. So it's very contextualized learning in the sense that what the students are learning, they're able to be putting into practice right away in the, the setting where they're doing the internship, they're working with a mentor, they will have to have a mentor there. And um, it's in that sense, there are obviously some differences because people will be deaconesses and not pastors. But in that sense, the approach is modeled off of the SMP approach that and the courses with our SMP program were developed specifically for that contextualized learning where things are being put into practice as the student goes through the program and, and discussed in that context, you know, with the, the, the mentor and, and so forth in that local setting. So it's that same kind of approach here. And in fact, of the 16 courses, 11 of them will be, because they're the basic theology, will be essentially the same courses as the SMP students would have um, with adjustment of assignments if there's anything in the assignments that would be specific to the pastoral office and then the other courses that are on things more specific to what pastors do in terms of the practical applications like you know word and sacrament ministry basically and the, the the leadership associated with the pastoral office those are substituted with courses that are specific specific to deaconess students you're listening to the coffee hour i'm andy bates i'm sarah golseth You're a miracle. You know that, right? A living, breathing, one-of-a-kind miracle. You were created to stand apart, to share your gifts in the service of others, to make an uncommon impact in a common world. And at Concordia University, it's our mission to help you do that, to live uncommon. To learn more about Concordia, go to cuw.edu. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We're talking with Deaconess Dr. Jillian Bond, Director of Deaconess Studies at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, about the new online Deaconess Studies program that's uh, becoming available. I believe that is that uh, starting this fall. Is that correct? It's actually starting in the spring. In the spring. Yes. So... Tell us more. You mentioned earlier when we were talking about the, the online Deaconess program, a students working in cohorts. Tell us a little bit more about the cohort. Is this a, a small group of students that you work with throughout your studies? That's correct, yes. So the students will come in at, at a particular starting point for the program, and there are no electives in the online program in terms of the actual courses. The there is obviously there are a variety of settings that the students are serving in. And so in terms of how they apply things and with the kinds of some of the kinds of questions and assignments that they're given, which involve that contextualization side of it, you know, as to how they actually use the same basic theology, but how they apply it in these different contexts of people in different kinds of need, people in different settings, um, whether it be congregational, institutional, so on. That's what I mean by contextualization. Um, the, and I'm sorry, you remind me of the question again. <laughs> I distracted myself. 
Well, it was, it was just asking about the, the cohorts. Like, oh, is yeah. that a small group? And I, I think you answered that for us. So, so yes, they go, they go through it. So there's no electives. They go through basically in lockstep all the way through. And actually the cohort um, is one of the strengths of the program. We've seen that already by analogy with the, uh, with the SMP program, which also works on a, a system of, of cohorts. And the students within those cohorts through the live sessions and through the, the online discussion boards and so on, actually develop quite strong um, links with one another and remain in contact you know, afterwards, which is helpful for deaconesses who tend to be not quite as numerous as of yet anyway in our synod. Um, it's good for them to have that, that network that they can also interact with, both during the studies and afterwards. Now, you mentioned that uh, that this happens in uh, in it's, it's a it's not a classroom setting. Obviously, it's online, but these classes are uh, it's is it the synchronous learning. Is that the term for it? The, once a week, there will be a synchronous session. It's a two hour session where they're um, the instructor and the students are on live together. And then there is work during the week that's assigned and that some of that is just directly the student working either by herself or working. There's areas, there's, there's requirements for discussion of things with their mentor, so mentor or student discussions. Um, and then there's also online discussion board capability and, and requirements. So they have both live discussion during the, the weekly sessions and um, online discussion board type discussions. There's also will be a requirement for students to come to campus three times during the program. One will be right at the beginning for orientation. So they will actually get to, to meet one another in person right at the start, which helps to build that sense of community um, and also to help them to be more clearly integrated into the, the seminary community. And then there will be two other times that they are required to come to campus. Uh, for what we're calling formation seminars, one each of which will be for a week. One of those will be at approximately the midpoint of the four-year program, and one will be close to the end. So then what kind of uh, practical experience uh, will, will students have during this program? That's going to depend. The, the, the exact details will depend some on the, the particular context in which they're serving. There are so, for example, there are congregations who would be looking for, as with those who take interns or graduates from the residential program, also there are congregations who are looking for a woman to serve as a general congregational deaconess. There are congregations who are looking for a woman to serve with more focus on certain particular areas. There is some variability that way. Also, if they're, if they're, um, there's going to be a congregational connection for these students during their studies, but if there's going to be an emphasis in what they're doing on working with a neighbor, with a local sort of neighborhood RSO or other institution like that, perhaps doing um, you know visit a lot of visitation chaplaincy in the appropriate aspects of chaplaincy type work with a, a local institution. Um, then obviously there would be more of a focus on those kinds of things. But I can give you an idea of the general breadth of things that deaconesses typically work with and say it. For some, it will be more focused in certain areas and others more focused in other areas. But there is a wide breadth of things that deaconesses are trained and equipped to do. So that would encompass, uh, obviously, the one thing that the women are uniquely well equipped to do, just because they're women, <laughs> is, is ministry to women. As I alluded to earlier, there are some women, quite a surprising number of them, actually, um, who have sometimes quite profound questions that they're just not comfortable to talk to a man about. And so no matter how good a pastor is, if a woman won't actually tell him that she's got questions, you know, obviously he has no way of dealing with that. But if there is a theologically trained woman, then she can do that, um, working alongside the pastor. So it's not like anything's being done behind his back. But, you know, I mean, you know, he knows that she's talking to people and if they want to not have their names involved and you know he knows that she's doing this but you know the, just the kind of thing she's doing but there's no need for um for her to divulge names that where, they, where there's a preference not to do that the kinds of questions i'm talking about by the way i mean one of the most common ones that i have encountered is women who are basically saying in one of the most 
concerning ones is women who have said in various ways, but essentially the question being, well, where did Jesus ever say he was God anyway? Well, that's a really fundamental question for a wow. Christian. You know? <laughs> and if they don't get that, we've got a real problem. And these are women, I encountered this on internship, I encountered this where I served before the seminary called me, and then talking with other deaconesses elsewhere, this is by no means unique to my experience. And these are women whose pastors had no idea they had these kinds of questions. Why they wouldn't ask the pastor was because it's not, I mean, at least in the cases that I'm familiar with, it was certainly not anything to do with those pastors per se, but just things out of those women's lives that they just have that kind of prior assumption, either that I've had it set up quite often, well, he's a man, so he think my, my questions are silly or stupid or something. Whether they would or not, it's not the point. That's the perception. That, that some women have of asking kind of deeper questions to a man. Um, maybe something from their earlier family life or from colleagues at work, or you know, who knows where they've got that from, but they have that, that perception. Um, and then also, uh, sometimes it's the, the authority of the pastoral office, the, which is not associated with the, the diaconal office. And so sometimes the answer would be, if you, if you ask why they wouldn't, want to talk to the pastor about this it's well because they don't want him to think less of them as a christian so there's various reasons but those are a couple of the you know kind of really glaring ones if you like you know i mean glaringly common that i've encountered and talked to other people that have encountered uh but so certainly ministry to women uh family ministry obviously there are certain other things other reasons why there are situations where a woman might be more comfortable talking to a woman so for example you know, in, in cases of, of, of abuse, domestic abuse, anything like that. Um, but also just in general, in bread, uh, ministry to youth, families, children, visitation, all kinds of different ministries. When I was serving in the parish, I was working with children, youth, um, a lot of visitation. I was working with um, outreach to the community. We had a food pantry. I was the one that would talk to the people who came to visit the food pantry and you know, get to know them and then pray with them and sort of talk, you know, generally talk about things with them, try and give spiritual care. Um, assimilation of new members, all kinds of things. Um, and it varies, say, from one congregation to another. And then, it, say, it's not necessarily an either or between congregations and other institutions, because when I was serving there in the parish, the congregation that I served with had entered into an arrangement with a senior service, um, this is sorry, senior citizen facility that uh, comes under the management of Lutheran senior services, where actually I spent a certain number of percentage of hours of my time doing work at that uh, at that place on that campus. So some of it was congregational, some of it was institutional. I would be certain day of the week I was the one from the uh, Lutheran Hillside Village was the institution uh, that I was the one that was on call for for emergency room visits or, and then I would do I would work with people in the early to mid stage dementia unit and I would visit people there with other needs so there's a broad variety does that give you a good sense of the kind of breadth of it I hope absolutely certainly yeah with just about uh, two minutes left um, you had mentioned earlier that the the online deaconess program leads to deaconess certification, yeah. um, qualifying then one to to be certified as a deaconess, consecrated as a deaconess, and serving in a congregation or an mm -hmm. organization, institution setting. Are students eligible for a degree for a? It, this is specifically a certification program. Is it uh, complementary to a degree program, or does it yeah. work in conjunction with a degree? It is a a, a, a certificate specifically a certification program however the courses are taught at a master's level so that means that students who would be eligible uh, can apply to the graduate school at the end of the program so once they would be eligible so they, they're going to have to have a bachelor's degree already and they would have to have maintained a suitable gpa uh, through the whole um, online deacon studies program but can apply for admission to the graduate school and do four additional courses and actually earn a master's degree. And that again, actually, is another thing where it's a, a parallel with how things are structured. Um, so obviously there's a lot of differences, but in that regard, it's similar to how things are structured for our SMP program. That's the certification program, but the courses are taught at a master's level. And after completion eligible 
um, students, students that have completed it can apply to the graduate school, do four more courses and earn a master's degree. So it will be the, the same idea with this. So what's the first step in uh, learning more about the online Deaconess Studies program? There is, uh, there is a place on, the, on our Concordia Seminary website to inquire uh, or to start an application. Also, folks are welcome to contact either me or our admissions office. And you can probably gather, I'm always happy to talk about <laughs> and what they do and studying for it because it's something I'm very passionate about and I love talking with people. <laughs> uh, but we also have great folks over in admissions too. And um, so that would be the starting points. Very good. Deaconess Dr. Jillian Bond, Director of Deaconess Studies at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Thank you so much for being our guest on the Coffee Hour today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure and I've enjoyed talking with you. You've been listening to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golsa. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support the Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Anywhere.